Okay, um, Drew's participating remotely, um, so he's like right there. <laughs> and he's gonna introduce Carol. <laughs> oh. Hey, it. so welcome everybody. Um, I'm sorry I can't be there, but uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Carol Tate, who's uh, a doctoral candidate in um, in our program, obviously. I'm sure you all know her. Uh, Carol's been doing some fascinating work with SRI organization, uh, exploring issues around major educational reform effort, uh, bringing some aspects of computer science to all students. It was a program uh, uh, initiated during the Obama uh, uh, term, and uh, and uh, it raises lots of important issues around uh, educational reform as and and curricular change. So, Carol, uh, take it away. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming today. I know it's the end of the semester. I think this is the last round back. I know it's a very busy time, so I really appreciate you coming out. Um, and I, um, you know, we're a small group, so I hope this will be a discussion. I'm going to uh, present a little bit about computer science for all generally, uh, just to give you an idea of my agenda here. Um, talk a little bit about why I find it a fascinating area to study. Um, it's kind of not a necessarily sensible area for me as I don't have a background in computer science. Uh, I was a history major and a one point math teacher, but um, I have found this to be a very interesting area for a lot of reasons. So I'd like to talk about that um, and sort of try to tie it and put it into context of some of the history of, you know, various reform efforts here in the United States. Um, and raise some questions. I think probably maybe raise more questions than answers in this presentation. But um, and after that piece, I'm going to uh, shift gears a little bit and share some data from some research I've done with new teachers of computer science at the middle school level in a project out west. Um, so I just want to start with this statement here, which I'll let you sit with that for a moment. Um, <clears throat> I found this on the website of uh, the CS for All organization, which is a, um, <clears throat> a broad sort of advocacy umbrella organization made up of over 500 projects of people working in this space now since Obama launched the Computer Science for All movement. Um, so just kind of read that through and we'll, I, 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 when I found this I was kind of excited because I thought, you know, I, read, I mean I read stuff like this like all day, every day, right? But I thought, oh, here we got it all packed together in this one sort of like delicious soup of slogans. <laughs> and there's a lot here to kind of unpack and peel back when we think about um, teaching computer science to all students. So let's kind of go through it a little bit. I don't know, I hope that wasn't a bad color choice there. but. Um, you know, first of all, saying computer science for all is a bold initiative to empower all U.S. students from kindergarten through high school to learn computer science. So, a bold initiative to begin with, yes, it's all kind of being promoted under this big umbrella, computer science for all, that's very important for everyone to learn computer science. But really, there are so many different projects, so many different stakeholders, so many different funders, <coughs> different uh, disciplinary backgrounds working in this area. So, we have, you know, in the CS for All advocacy organization that I mentioned, we have, you know, tech companies, we have uh, National Science Foundation funding a lot of work in this area, we have a lot of, you know, university researchers working on designs for curriculum, um, we have a lot of uh, policy advocacy happening at, you know, local, state, federal level to make all kinds of um, requirements about teaching computer science, to get computer science courses to count for certain types of credit for graduation, um, for admission to higher ed, uh, and around certification issues. I mean, there's just so much going on here. And so this initiative is in some ways one big push, um, but it has a lot of different facets and aspects. And then in this same piece, um, to empower all US students from kindergarten through high school to learn computer science. So, being education people, what comes to mind when you read that? 
does it raise any questions? Like, what does it mean for a kindergartner to learn computer science, right? Do, do we know what it means for a kindergartner to learn computer science? How do we know if a kindergartner has learned computer science? <laughs> There's a lot, a lot to unpack. Um, so we want students to be equipped with the computational thinking skills they need to be creators in the digital economy, not just consumers, and to be active citizens in their technology-driven world. So this is also very familiar language. This appears in a lot of the sort of promotion of this program. So I just want to think a little bit about that. Like, what do you think that means to be creators and not consumers? Yeah. To me, it sounds like it, it should be emphasizing with programming skills as opposed to just teaching how to use computers. Okay, so that would be like, and you hear this phrase sometimes, program or be programmed, right? Like either you're going to be in control or you're going to be like a cog <laughs> in the wheel or something like that, right? Yeah, and a lot of the, a lot of the um, we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, further on, but a lot of the programs are not very specifically focused on coding, and in fact, a lot of people get annoyed in the computer science education realm when you sort of talk about it like, oh, you're just teaching them how to code. Because, um, you know, they would say one thing you hear a lot is like, well, coding is to computer science like, um, you know, the telescope is to astronomy or something, right? Like it's only this tool, this small piece of all that it is. But I think you have kind of hit on it that it is a sort of a, an empowerment message, right? That if we want students to be empowered, they, they have to know something about this technology, right? And um, and to be active citizens, because this is how the world is now, right? Um, our economy is shifting. This is a new basic skill. This is going to be necessary for social mobility, economic opportunity. So these are kind of um, reasons or rationales for education reform that are not new at all, right? I mean. We had these same rationales at the turn of the 20th century, right? The economy was shifting quite a bit then too, right? And we've had other various shifts over time, and it's fallen to schools to kind of respond to those and prepare everybody uh, for what is coming. So there are a lot of kind of um, goals embedded in here. A lot of them are kind of either implicit or just not very highly elaborated, you know? So. Um, it, it makes for a very embracing democratic platform. It's something sort of everyone can get behind. It's hard to argue, right, with this. But on the other hand, it doesn't really give us any prescriptions for like how to actually accomplish this, right? And there isn't much attention to um, the how, right? The, like the philosophies of teaching and learning, the science of teaching and learning, the, you know, and or even some of the the reasons, but we do have embedded in here um, some very sort of familiar themes of um, social mobility as a you know prime sort of um, reason for schooling, right? Also, social efficiency. We well, you know that we need to create our workforce, right? And um, also the sort of personal empowerment idea. These are ideas that like um, David and I already talked about a lot in terms of education, public goods, and private goods. They're all wrapped up in this package here. So here is President Obama at the Hour of Code. And this was right around the time they launched Computer Science for All in 2016, which was a really exciting time for this field because he said, you know, he pledged something like $4 billion, it was $4 billion for computer science education. That never materialized, obviously. But you know, he was talking about computer science education in the first five minutes of the State of the Union address, which was a pretty big deal. You know, it was a big uh, endorsement and a big kind of um, commitment. Um, and so the CS for All uh, advocacy group formed as this, you know, with all of these sort of industry um, professionals, Association of Computing Machinery, the College Board, Computer Science Teachers Association, as well as aforementioned tech companies and um, other kinds of stakeholders. So um, the jobs thing, this is from code.org, which is um, a major force in this space, um, lobbying for more computer science education. 
Um, and this jobs argument is a familiar one. I could put up all kinds of statistics about you know the shortages that they expect in different fields and this and that would be easy to find, but I'm not gonna go into that today. But I do want to kind of talk about some of the major rationales because um, they do tend to kind of fall into a set of not too many buckets. And um, this is uh, based on work by Paul Vogel from City University of New York to do a study about people's rationales. Um, New York City, by the way, is one of the cities that's really embraced this movement and has requirements at every grade band for some kind of computer science experience. Um, so preparing for jobs uh, of the future, of course. Um, the idea that kids without computer skills will be left behind. Students who are already marginalized in our society are going to get further marginalized. So a big part of this push is to bring broaden participation in computer science, to bring in students who are underrepresented, girls, um, and minorities. So that it's not only uh, white and Asian boys taking the AP computer science test, which has you know, kind of been the case um, in the past. But what's really interesting about this uh, topic for me is that, you know, we have this whole jobs preparation push. Now, historically, school as jobs preparation was sort of like, um, you know, VOTEC, right? Career technical education, right? And now we have <coughs> the sort of career technical education track and the <coughs> academic, even, even elite academic, you know, kinds of subjects like this coming together into one kind of um, push, like right? one subject area. And that does cause a certain amount of tension in terms of course content. It, it causes tension in terms of like pedagogical styles and traditions because those two sort of tracks in high school have really developed somewhat independently, right? And now we have them coming together. Um, Partly because of this jobs focus, and partly, I think, frankly, because there's a lot of money in career technical education at the federal level. And so people who want to push computer science can kind of bring that in. Um, so here are also preparing the workforce. Now, these may seem like sort of the same thing, but they're kind of from the two different perspectives. If you, if you think of this public good, private good kind of divide, right? The first one is sort of about getting these kids, you know, some social mobility through jobs. The second one is more like our economic competitiveness. Are we going to have the workforce that we need? And um, part of that is having enough people that are trained in computer science, but it's also having a more diverse pipeline in computer science, right? Because if you have everybody making everything from one perspective, right, then that's a problem. We don't have the voices of all the kinds of people. So another argument which um, uh, Mark Bissell makes uh, pretty eloquently is that you know computing is everywhere. It's 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 basically natural science at this point, right? It's like so much a part of our world that to not know about computing is almost like not knowing about photosynthesis or something like that, right? That it's just kind of so much a part of our world, um, and. Lastly, that um, so, and I, I also just want to mention about computing is everywhere is also in terms of science that it is so much a part of how we do science now, right? That kind of become what they call a third pillar of science, right? Foreign students and call it third pillar of science along with the theory and experimentation. So you can't really do without computing if you're in the STEM fields. Um, and then lastly, that access to CS education is a social justice issue. So I talked about that in terms of diversifying the pipeline, but it's, it's really about this sort of empowerment idea that you were talking about at the beginning that, you know, we can't just have people so totally marginalized by not knowing computer science. So in terms of these rationales, which all kind of, you know, seem very sensible, it's, it's important to think about kind of, um, expectations and sort of the realities of enacting a reform like this because um, when you say access to CS education is a social justice issue that's a very defensible position I think but you're also kind of saying like uh, and this is a there's a long tradition of this in this country right of saying like well we have this societal problem and schools gonna fix it right like 
this is what uh, Tayak and Cuban call the sort of secular religion that we have here about education, right? That uh, whatever's wrong with society, whether it was back in you know the days of Horace Mann, it was you know a moral crisis, right? Schools are going to fix the moral crisis that we're facing now. We have this sort of extreme economic inequality, and that you know if we just teach everybody computer science, you know, that will help. With that. <laughs> So that's a kind of a lot to put on a, to put on this. Um, I want to talk a little bit. I apologize; it's a little hard to see, but um, just about some definitions here, as, as we touched on before. Um, this is from uh, the organization, the organization Digital Promise. Um, it provides these sort of this sort of visual to kind of give an idea about the sort of scope of the place of coding, because people tend to really focus on coding, our code is a big thing for exposing people to computer science. And, but the idea here is that computer science is a very big field and encompasses a lot of different um, aspects, including human-computer interaction kinds of things. And that computational thinking is a way of formulating problems so that a computer can solve them. Um, there's been a lot of work around what computational thinking is and some debate about whether it is actually anything new, or if it's just sort of a generic problem-solving kind of ability. Um, and, you know, that also brings up more issues that we'll talk about later, about whether it is teachable and transferable. Um, but um, it does clearly have overlaps with other disciplines, with engineering design kinds of processes, with um, systems thinking, design thinking, mathematical problem solving and that kind of stuff. Um, my colleague Shish Grover has a very often cited list of um, things involved in computational thinking, which includes abstraction, decomposition, algorithms, recursion, parallelism, efficiency, debugging, and data management, which are all things that sound very computery, but they're also all things that can be used for problem solving without a computer. <coughs> So I want to kind of, we talked about rationales for this movement, but I want to also kind of um, just look at a couple of quotations in terms of the variety of perspectives on sort of what we're doing with this computer science uh, education. So this, uh, President Obama's statement that it's no longer an optional skill, it's a basic skill. This is kind of that same idea that, you know, to get along in the modern world, you're going to be marginalized if you don't have this. It's often described as a literacy, which is a really good way to describe something if you're trying to make it sound like it's necessary and important for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that trick has been tried before. Um, <laughs> but uh, it does kind of sound like he's talking about coding to me, right? Like that he's, that, that's his um, sort of conception of it. Um, this uh, quote was used quite a lot by code.org in one of their sort of big videos to sort of promote the hour of code so many years ago. Um, and this gets at that computational thinking idea, right? This faith that if people learn how to use a computer, that that's going to help them just be a better thinker in other domains. And this is a really largely unexamined I think this quote from um, Yasmin Kafai is, is very interesting because it really exemplifies what a lot of these programs are focusing on, which is computing as a social activity, as a creative activity, as a way to connect with other people, and um, that the learning goals of a lot of these programs are very much about uh, identity building, right? Making students feel like computing is something that they can do, that they can participate in. It, uh, you know, it really reflects a very sociocultural kind of view of how people learn, right? As opposed to, say, a um, course on how to code in Python or something like that, right? So, here you can kind of see that different programs are going to have sort of different reasons for being and um, that that might lead to very different 
kinds of method, methods and sort of theories of action about accomplishing these goals. So a lot of what is, you know, happening with this, with this movement is, is not um, brand new. You know, it's easy to think with computer science, oh, you know, the world's totally different, right? We've had this information technology revolution, nothing is the same, school has to be totally different, and, um, you know, it's all new. But a lot of uh, the advocacy in this area and a lot of the designs for learning in the computer science curricula um, projects that I've worked on anyway are, are really about this sort of hands-on making creative kind of pedagogy, right? And that's something that we've been seeing, you know, pushed over the years for a long, long time, right? Since before the 20th century. Um, it's had a hard time kind of taking over schooling. Um, you know, it was up against behaviorist theory for one thing for a long time, but this comes up over and over. Um, this is not the first time that we've had a push to sort of broaden access to elite content, right? Like we had this in the 60s and 70s. We had this when the high school was first, you know, opened up, and instead of having 10 percent of those age kids in high school, we started having 90 plus percent. Um, and we've had this in, um, you know, in the 90s and 2000s with the like uh, Bob Moses algebra project. You know, we have these subjects that are gatekeepers, and if we let more people in, then that will be a good thing. Um, and the whole computational thinking thing, of course, recalls like many uh, movements for emphasizing critical thinking and problem solving over discrete facts. So like I got my teaching degree here at the GSC in 91. And at that point it was all like, yeah, critical thinking. It was like it's swinging back from a very sort of skill-based, basic skills kind of emphasis in schools to exactly this kind of thing. It wasn't called computational thinking at the time, but it, it has a lot of um, similarities. And um, So, but, you know, this does raise certain questions, right? I mean, in terms of the, the computational thinking and the theory of thinking, we still have this perennial question, like, is this really going to transfer? Is this something that is um, a domain general kind of ability that we can teach? And if it is, how will we know if we've succeeded in teaching it? So um, before we turn to the, the data, I want to just kind of, you know, knowing that we've gone through this before, talk a little bit about some of the lessons that have been learned from previous efforts to accomplish these kinds of goals, right? Um, so here we have what I would call some lessons of history, right? The first being that if you don't intend to the details of teacher-student interaction in the classroom, that your reform is probably not going to take hold. Um, right now, Computer Science for All is enjoying a lot of um, enthusiasm. It's enjoying a lot of funding and a lot of attention. But um, I think that, you know, unless we really get deeper into the pedagogy of computer science and um, really examine the learning targets, that we're going to be in trouble because uh, we learned this <coughs> uh, particularly during the standards-based math uh, reform, for example, in the 90s, that, you know, wonderful ideas and wonderful materials and broad slogans are really not going to carry the day if teachers don't know how to teach what you're trying to teach. Similarly, policies alone are not enough. We have a bit, a lot of policy pushes going on now, but they're going to have to be accompanied by more attention to the experience of teachers and how to build capacity for teaching computer science and uh, for novices and young, young people. And lastly, Richard Elmore's statement that you need to have higher level content, improve teacher knowledge and skills, and improve student engagement to accomplish your goals. 
So um, with that statement that we need to focus on teachers, I'd like to turn to um, some of my data from one of the projects I work on at SRI, which um, is called Scalable Game Design. It is a project from a research group at University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, and I had the opportunity to interview uh, some scalable game design teachers. Uh, I'll just tell you a little bit kind of about this project to give you a background on what they do. This is a middle school uh, curriculum that gets inserted into existing elective courses. So for example, middle school typically will have like three or four sessions during the year where kids take, you know, maybe some media class, a tech prep class, or an art class, or something, and it's elective, and it rotates through the year. So um, this research group's approach was to, you know, they were really looking to create systemic computer science education, I meaning they wanted it to be really not an add-on, right? It's part of the regular curriculum and reaching all students. So their, their strategy was to um, go into these middle school lectures that all kids eventually would, would cycle through. And they started with this authoring platform that is for creating uh, 1980s style video arcade type of games, like Frogger, Pokemon, things like that. So this was developed originally for research on sort of the cognition around um, computing and programming. It was then used in after school programs, and then they wrote a sort of fully built out curriculum and a professional development program for teachers, and they moved it into schools. And it really grew quite a bit. And this was quite early, I and mean, this was way before, um, you know, Obama's pronouncement or anything. This is in the early 2000s, and it was really one of the programs that had the broadest reach uh, for novice teachers of computer science. So Excuse me, you said that's early when? Uh, well, I think 2003 was when they first were using it in like one middle school in Colorado, and then it just sort of gradually, uh, actually quite rapidly spread. Yeah. Um, so we had these teachers who had, uh, some of them had participated in several years of this research project, but I was particularly interested. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I, I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, before I talk about the teachers, about the sort of um, theory of action of scalable game design. So their idea was really to expose all, everybody, as I said, in the middle schools that got to every kid who was in who was enrolled. Uh, they were very focused on motivation. So the, they designed the curriculum so that you know, with five to ten hours in the classroom, they could these kids could build a fully functional video game themselves. So the offering platform that um, Alex designed. Um, they really focused on the pedagogy element, so they really spent a lot of time developing their teacher development so that teachers would be able to support this even if they had no um, computer science background. And they did it by kind of operationalizing computational thinking. As, so instead of it being this sort of amorphous problem solving ability, they actually um, created a whole list of actions that happen in the game, like absorption or collision or hill climbing, all the things that these little agents do in, in a video game. And they taught computational thinking through those actions. So they had sort of like a unique pedagogy for the idea of computational thinking constructs. Um, so I was interested in knowing, first of all, how these teachers are conceptualizing computational thinking, what they see the value of it as. Do they teach these lessons differently from how they were teaching other subjects? And these are teachers who come from a variety of backgrounds. Um, some of them are, a lot of them were business class kind of teachers. So their job had been to, um, you know, teach people how to use Microsoft Office, make a brochure, or that kind of thing. So uh, that was quite a, a change. And, and many of them did, had nothing to do with computing. They were art teachers or librarians or other kinds of teachers. So I was interested in differences that they saw in what they were doing and in what challenges they, they found. Um, so I started with uh, the 293 teachers who had done at least one of these 35-hour uh, professional development courses that they run in the summer at Boulder. 
uh, since 2012, and that we can still get a hold of. And we surveyed all of these teachers as part of our evaluation of the project. Um, and in the survey, inserted a couple questions like, would you be willing to do an interview? And also, uh, are they still using scalable game design? Because these teachers were all finished with their research commitments, right? So I was interested in, are they persisters, basically? Did it get ingrained into their practice? Um, and uh, I, I went with anybody who said it either remained the same or increased, because these are the people I was interested in talking to, which gave me uh, 19 in the end who could be interviewed, and I got 16 of them. And the survey instrument asked them about strategies, challenges, how students have responded, and what kind of outcomes they've observed. So um, in terms of what they see the value of, of teaching computational thinking, we see these familiar, you know, familiar reasons. Um, they did sort of seem to subscribe to the literacy uh, theory that this was an important literacy alongside reading and writing and arithmetic. Um, now we have to add coding. But interestingly, most of them talk more about general abilities than specific skills. So um, all of them, and you know, I don't know how to figure out how, how to figure this out. But I always suspect when I talk to I talk to a lot of computer science teachers, and they a lot of them say things like this, and um, it's hard to know if they're just sort of repeating what was in the PD, you know. <laughs> Or whether they do. I don't know. Maybe we can talk about that. Thanks for figuring that out. Um, what was interesting to me here is that they really talked not so much about learning the computing stuff, but, but about the changes that they saw in the kids. So words like resilient, you know, just resilient came up over and over. I just picked out a few examples here, but um, there were many, many examples. Of statements about how the kids were more resilient, how they were getting better at fixing things themselves, um, that they were better at struggling through problems and being more creative. In terms of teaching practice, uh, a lot of teachers talked about how they feel like they're doing things differently. Now keep in mind, some of these teachers were teaching, you know, how to use Excel or something like that as their subject. So they weren't in these very sort of inquiry-oriented classes generally, right? These are the specialist teachers. They're not the primary subject theory teachers for the most part. Um, so they kind of learned to stop spoon feeding them. They got to, uh, you know, get them to try to figure things out for themselves. Basically, to hang back and you know, think of the learning as happening, <coughs> the interaction of the kids with the materials, and from the process, rather than being something that they were teaching them. And uh, for a lot of them, they didn't really have a choice because they weren't very well versed in the, you know, game design. <laughs> it was very new for a lot of these teachers. Um, but I, you know. On the last slide, it, the word that, I mean, it just, I think there was like 12 times in 16 interviews where I had them saying, struggle, like, I gotta let them struggle. Now I know they need to struggle. You know, which I thought was really, it was pretty, pretty interesting. Um, in terms of challenging challenges, they're pretty much what you would expect, uh, not knowing the content, managing the instruction, we've got all these kids on computers or technical issues, um, and learning how to promote collaboration. My job is to provide opportunities to provide resources. I need to kind of model, you know, in terms of what they're modeling for their students, they're modeling like, I got to figure this out, you got to figure it out too. Like, I don't know how to do it, right? I, I will say I observed this, um, this PD and it was, um, it was pretty challenging. I mean, learning this tool was challenging for the teachers. 
So they're getting comfortable with not knowing everything and having to kind of learn stuff on the fly. I don't know if um, anybody read the, the article that was attached, but it was um, there was a quote from a teacher at this PD who I observed. Um, she was a Spanish teacher, actually. And um, she was in there learning this game design, trying to design a product game. And she was flipping out. I mean, she was so overwhelmed and like crying in the hallway, like just so. And it was really amazing to me because they kind of assigned her a buddy who like went to lunch with her and like sat with her and helped her. But she was so dogged and she taught in a very high needs school and she was just like, my kids need this. She's like, I have to stay. I have to learn this because my kids need this. I mean, it was really quite moving. I mean, she was just so overwhelmed and she just persisted through it because she was like, I got to I got to figure this out. She's like, this is like having shoes, you know, like you can't, these kids can't go through life without knowing this stuff. So it was pretty, pretty intense. Um, What I took away from these interviews is, you know, and this, I have a paper on this data which got accepted to ERA and one of the criticisms from one of the reviewers, which I thought was very spot on, was that this is kind of like a very broad statement to make, right? <laughs> so one of the things I want your help with when we talk about this is sort of how to deal with this kind of data, right? I've only got 16 teachers. It's obviously very limited. It's, a, it's one kind of a program and there's millions of these different Yes, for all programs. But, um, you know, I did have teachers telling me, like, this changed my life, right? I had like 50, 60 year old teachers just being like, you know, this totally changed the way I teach, learning this. And I really think there's something here. I, I'm very jaded about some of the claims about computer science for all in terms of what it can accomplish. But on the other hand, in terms of thinking about sort of long held goals for education and the roles of teachers and students. This kind of creative work happening with computing seems to hold a lot of promise and also for the teachers, for, for changing the teaching profession. And it makes me think a lot about, you know, this huge looming problem of like, okay, if we're teaching computer science, first of all, we don't even have enough math teachers, right? Like, we don't have any computer science teachers, basically. So how are we going to put together what we want to teach with you know, capacity building for, for the teaching. I think it was really interesting that what the teachers talked about was not really their ability to make games, right? That was kind of the ancillary. What they talked about was their approach to learning and their confidence and all of these other sort of uh, attributes and practices. So that's it. <laughs> and I hope that we can, you know, talk about what comes up here. Yeah, so two questions. One is Nama is looking up at the so NGSS has computational thinking as one of the practices. Yes. And I don't remember how they define it. So I'm curious to see what sort of part of this parcel. Is yeah, I think it's, it's very closely aligned with sort of the engineering design process, you know. Yes. I think, I think um, it's also more on mathematics, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. To be like right. So it's using mathematics and computational yeah. thinking. But um, you've hit on like a real turf war that's going on, which I'm sure you're aware of, of between like com computer science education and science. Right. <laughs> Science. And science, right? So, well, I mean, I think on on some level, it's a silly turf war to have. Yeah. Because first of all, it's in the stand. I can see a lot of this sort of brought in as a toy horse under the guise of this practice, which is one of the hardest practices for teachers to deal with because it's it's not very clear. It's also not as abundant. Terms of the performance expectation. So you see monitoring and argumentation and questioning a ton. But then 
It's like, oh, look, I'm busy with a year. And look, it's not as well. Basic. Part of that is the assessment challenge, you know, that right. it's so lacking in assessments. And when I talk to teachers from a variety of different projects, and I actually, for a time, I was running a sort of online PLC for teachers, of, um, a course called Exploring Computer Science. And like they are so hungry for some way to figure out because they're learning anything and and for how to evaluate their work and it's um part of the issue is you know remember the the quote from yasmin about participation identity development that can be like a lot of the courses are really focused on that so really the grade is participation right i mean if that's what your learning goal is right so, so, I'm so I'm really getting lost. I can't even that. So, what standard did you say goes to? It's not a standard. So, the science standards are divided into three pillars. There's ideas, which are what is traditionally content. There are um, practices, which are scientific ways of doing things in order to generate knowledge, like arguing, asking questions, doing experiments, investigating, and that of advising. And so mathematizing of those or the, as one of those mathematizing and computational thinking. Yes. And then you were saying I was saying that um, the designs of some of the courses that are being implemented to accomplish this, um, particularly uh, for one example is a course called Exploring Computer Science, which was developed at UCLA in response to the low participation rates among minorities and low availability of courses. But it, you know, it, it's a course that was designed by sociologists to accomplish a sort of social issue, right? And it's and it takes a very sociocultural view of learning. I mean, I'm not saying that in a pejorative way, but I'm just saying the it's a participation metaphor. It's not an acquisition metaphor, right? It's like the kids are if they're doing it and they're feeling good about it, and the projects that they're doing are related to their home communities and their funds of knowledge and you know it's a whole kind of but they're computer projects. Yeah, yeah. They're building apps or games or the question is how do you evaluate websites? That? Right. Right. Because you can evaluate their use of particular algorithms and mm -hmm. programming methods, right? Like right. There's bits and pieces, which is what happens in the traditional computer science class at the university. It's not like we don't have assessment for this. Universities didn't operate computer science degrees for years. Mm -hmm. They have tests. So They've automated so assessment. assessment. Yeah. Some, something. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure what because that's not my field, but I'm sure you can assess people's understandings of the components and inner relationships of programs. Okay, um, but that that's not a major goal. It is a goal. I don't think it's the only goal see, that's for K twelve because the, the, you can assess the content, but it's actually the process you're wanting, and the process is going to be in a way new every time. Well, it's both the process of how they go around about figuring out what code to even write. Yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot of thinking that needs to have to happen before. You and it's not even just the process; it's also the attitudes. I mean, what really gets and assessed in a lot of these process. programs is dispositions. It's like, you, do you think you might want to take more computer science, or you know, do you see yourself going into this? Like, that's kind of the the benchmark for some of the for some of the programs. And in terms of college, yeah, they've been teaching computer science, but I think it's important to note too that there's not a very well-developed pedagogy at the college level either. It's been kind of like, okay, people who, it's more like they put out the cat food, you know, like, or if you want to do computer science, you can come and figure it out. I don't know how good we are at actually developing talent, you know, and instead of just identifying talent. In, right, in, but it's true also for college physics, and, right? I mean, the people yeah, who yeah, survive yeah, and go on to grad school are the ones that came with the cat food, right? Yeah. Ultimately, we don't make great scientists out of the people that don't do well in bio 101. Right? <laughs> right. So, right. Uh, right. So, one question that I had uh, actually, it has to do with the overwhelming of the teachers, and you said that you wanted to think of ways to deepen or show how teachers are impacted and changed by this and, and how even without formal tools of they're getting a crunch of PD, but how can mm -hmm. they still do this? And I'm wondering if they can leverage expertise in the classroom. So I am wondering if teachers reported, because you weren't in there, you didn't right. see, right? But I wonder if they reported things like 
well, you know, this one kid had a problem. We had to debug it. I wasn't sure what to do. And then another kid in this class or another class came and saved the day by showing up. I wonder mm -hmm. if you're actually leveraging some of the knowledge that kids may have. Yeah, they talk about that a lot, actually, that they're, um, you mean like <clears throat> drawing on the expertise of kids that are in the room yeah. or, yeah. So they are acting kind of more like it's a all facilitator. Nonsense. If the teacher doesn't know how to program, it, it, there's no reason to believe that that teacher is any more knowledgeable about debugging right. than the group of five roles she has in the classroom. Right. 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 The classroom, so. right. Yeah. so I had sort of a question, and then it leads to maybe a discussion on it. Um, in this SGD, do they actually build a game? They do. They build a working game and they also uh, share the game. So there's an arcade online they can upload their game to so other people can play their game and comment on it and so, so improve the, the it. The things that it made me think about, especially when you showed your teacher comments, was first of all, that it's it's a skill, it's not content. You have to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could say you learn content, you could give a list, whatever. But really it's the skill of making it happen. Mm -hmm. And then there's no right answer, basically because you were needing to make something new. So you're starting out with divergent thinking, but it's got to work. So you're going to convergent. Mm -hmm. Because if you can't make it work, then, it, then you really have failed at your own test that you set yourself. And then as far as the teachers, what's fascinating to me is it's forcing them to teach something that they don't know. Mm -hmm. And if you have to teach something you don't know, you have to let the students take a lead. Yeah. And, and and the only way that anybody really learns is by delving into it themselves. And students get into a habit of just feeling that it's meant to be given them, even in graduate school. Yeah. And and when you say to them, Oh, well, the textbook, you know, is kind of bad about that, and you say to them, look up what the, where they got their information. Right. One one student in my graduate class said, Well, I used to think that the textbooks had it right. I'm thinking, well, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it really brings up very fundamental questions, right? Like, does teaching cause learning, right? Or yeah, does study I mean, cause learning? Yeah. <laughs> or, you well, know, it really challenges where is knowledge well, located? Yeah, right? I, wonder, I mean, we have this problem of not having enough math teachers or not having enough children learning math very well. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if this whole process is a way into math. Well, there is one program that I'm studying called Bootstrap World, which was um, developed specifically to teach algebra originally. It now is in several other domains. So this is an example of a very different approach, right? We have some really fundamentally different approaches going on. So we have this sort of game design thing, right, which is about, you know, creativity and, you know, making games and whatever and learning these processes that way. And then we have, uh, and that, you know, their, their way again of trying to make it systemic is to put it in the middle school and make sure all the kids do it. Another way to try to make it systemic is to put it into existing courses like math or science. So there are a lot of lines of work like um, NetLogo and Project Guts and um, Bootstrap where you're teaching computing and um, or co computational thinking maybe and the subject area at the same time. I work on one of those projects with um, some people from Vanderbilt and Stanford that are working on uh, kinematics curriculum. And so it's, you know, we have a programming environment and the kids are creating simulations to learn about velocity and all of this stuff. Um, wow. You so know, they're creating? They're creating. Okay. So they're, they're using, it looks a little bit like Scratch. So they Is have blocks. Tango? Hmm? Is this Tango? No. no, it's C2 STEM with Gautam Biswas. Yeah. So it's, um, they're sort of, you know, like make the truck go from here to here during this amount of time and stop and using acceleration and stuff like that. So they're having to actually make it work and learning about the concepts by getting that feedback from the simulation. So that's that's one whole kind of line of work also. And then they have these others, like I mentioned, exploring computer science, which is very much sort of like make an app about a problem in your community. You know, it's it's a very different kind of thing. And it's interesting, I mean, in terms of PD, um, I work on a project in San Francisco Unified School District, and they were organizing PD at San Francisco State for teachers in the summer, and they had them for, I don't know, like four days or something, or three days. 
And they were literally spending half that time on culturally relevant pedagogy, like teaching them about how to connect with students' interests and not about the computer science content, which some of them were not very happy about. But you know, it just shows what the commit the commitments are very different in these different camps in terms of what they're hoping to accomplish. Not to put it in art, I think it's mean stuff. Hmm? I think that yes, mean stuff is in art, but she also puts things into art. So what they do yeah. is um, they design these little gadgets that you can put in clothing that light up and go so yeah, the wearables, like yeah. And put the it like creates like a thermometer built in and it changes the color. <laughs> It's very cool. And actually, the scalable game design teachers, some of the ones that I saw out in Colorado, uh, there were quite a few that were art teachers, and they were developing some really amazing stuff. Uh, and it really made me think, like, this is the way to go, because I work on one project where a whole bunch of teachers were trained by TFA to, to teach computer science in their, in their schools that they were assigned to. And like half of them didn't get the class in the end, even though it had been put on the schedule and they had recruited students because they could teach math. And when push came to shove, they got pulled off and to teach math. And you know, one of them was in a school in South Carolina where they're importing teachers from the Philippines, literally, like in Ghana, because they don't have enough people to teach in the school district. And you know, she was like the one math teacher for 400 kids. So you're not getting computer science on the schedule, you know, in that scenario. And art teachers are really, I think, a, a good place to work. Um, and engineering, you know, you know, huge push with doing the teachers for either. Like you can line the engineering and computational science to get some of that problem because there's no teachers. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're required. So yeah, yeah. Probably they should be double trained. I, and the GSC does not have either an engineering nor computer science, or a, you know, program certification program. So yeah. find physics essentially, and bio. That's it. What is the math they don't have? And math, right? So, well, interestingly, um, the PI from the Scalable Game Design Project, who's a computer scientist, he, Alex Screpening, he is Swiss. Um, and he now lives in Switzerland, and he's in charge of all the pre-service teachers learning computer science enough to teach in school. Like that's their in Switzerland. Yeah, that's their um, their plan of attack is to make sure that's part of every teacher's training. And he got to do that in uh, Central. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Do it for the nerd. Even that doesn't work. You mentioned that like this reform, like others, um, focuses on like authentic mm -hmm. uh, environments for, for the education. So, what do you think is like an authentic computer science education environment? Because it's not just like having the computer in front of you, right? So that's kind of just a necessary component. Um, well, I guess I mean one way I would think of the authenticity is, for example having an assignment to solve a problem in your community by creating an app that people could use. So one thing that happened in New York that I heard about in the Bronx, a kid made an app for um, when kids who have gotten to college out of his school, like when they come home, kids who are homeless, like who don't have a place to live, it was like an app for helping them figure out like where they can stay when college is not in session and they're back in the Bronx. You know, that's something that's like community need, you know. So there's a lot of authenticity, and a lot of the authenticity comes from these sharing, you know, that you can put it, even a game, that you can put it up on a platform and somebody else can play it. Like you've made a real thing that's out there in the world. It's not just a, you know, a classroom assignment. Um, also, there's a big emphasis on teaching peer programming, which is an authentic programming sort of strategy or method that's used in industry where people work on things together. Yeah. So those are the only examples. 